Can uh, everybody can see me and everybody can hear me? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Let, let me know if we need to be louder or if I'm too loud. Okay. So hey, good morning, everybody. <laughs> uh, hope everybody's doing okay, nice and safe during these uh, strange times and blizzards and all sorts of stuff. What's going to come next? But um, so today's demonstration is called segmenting for dummies. Um, thank you, Mike Nathal, for the help on the title on that. Um, so what is segmenting? So segmenting is the process of cutting up usually dried lumber in such a fashion that you can glue it up into some sort of a segmented angular kind of ring. Then you take these rings and you stack them on top of other rings, probably varying in size somehow, to build up some sort of a form. Uh, and this form can be a platter, it can be a bowl, it can be a, a hollow form, vase, urn, uh, even spindle turn. Anything that you can do with solid wood, traditional wood turning, you can adapt to segmented turning. Um, so for today's demo, we're gonna do just kind of a simple uh, open vase. But um, I'm sure you've seen when, when we used to see each other in person, uh, on the show and tell table, there was a, a fair amount of segmented pieces, bowls and platters and things like that. So um, you can really do anything. Um, in this demo, we're gonna be talking specifically about the, what's called the wedgie sled which is what we'll be using with a table saw to cut the, the specific angled pieces of our, our segmented rings. So um, let me give you a little background on my kind of uh, history and experience with segmented turning. So I, I, I don't know that I consider myself a segmented turner. I still like solid wood as, as most of us do. Uh, but I like segmented turning because it has given me a whole nother outlet uh, to create, uh, as you guys know, I make pet urns and, and human urns and things like that. So it's given me uh, another, yes. You got multiple mo open mics. I think maybe Tomash's mic is still open. We're getting all sorts of background. I'll turn it off. Okay, we're gonna. Okay, is that sound better, guys? Yeah. Okay, all right. So um, uh, where were we? So uh, my segmenting history. So I had a, a, a customer that I've made quite a few pet urns for, and she requested that I make her an urn completely out of blood wood. And I said, well, unfortunately, I can't do that because uh, you can't import a log of blood wood here into the States. Um, and you can get bowl blanks and things like that, but I wasn't really happy with the idea of just gluing up a bunch of bowl blanks. So um, I kind of toyed with the idea of doing it out of segments because you can get uh, bloodwood lumber from Rockler and other places, but um, you, can, uh, you can go that route. So I sent her a couple examples of segmented pieces so she kind of understand the brick layer kind of effect. Um, and I uh, kind of sketched up a, a general idea that I had to do it. And she said, all right, let's, let's go for it. So uh, like, like any uh, modern day person that wants to learn how to do something, I of course went straight to YouTube and uh, took a crash course in, uh, <laughs> in segment and turning on YouTube. It's just such a wonderful uh, medium uh, to be able to learn just about anything. So uh, in my studying, so to speak, uh, I kept seeing these videos on this thing called a wedgie sled. And uh, I avoided watching it just sounded stupid to me. Um, you know, my dad was a woodworker. So he taught me and plus being a machinist and blah, blah, blah. My dad always felt that those, those kinds of tools were he called them yuppie tools. You know, it was uh, some cheap tool that somebody's you know 1995 or, or 
five payments of twenty nine ninety five, that kind of stuff, and usually made out of plastic. And he just avoided those. You know, it was he grew up. You know, craftsman tools where you kept a wrench for life, and you could just replace it if it broke somehow. So I just avoided that kind of stuff myself. But I kept seeing these videos popping up, and I'm seeing videos by other people on YouTube that are using, you know, some form of a wedgie sled. And so I decided, all right, let me, let me take a look at this and it, maybe it'll be a, a, a good laugh. So I, I ended up finding the series of videos by the guy who invented the wedgie sled and his name is Jerry Bennett. And in watching the video of Jerry using the wedgie sled to cut his segments, I, I was just amazed at how simple it is, how simple the jig is and how simple it is to, to make perfect segments. So um, it, it, and on top of all that, he actually has a video on YouTube that shows how to make it start to finish all the materials, all the dimensions, everything you need for free. I just happened to have everything I needed uh, scrap wise in my workshop to do it. So uh, on a Saturday, probably took me about two hours to make the wedgie sled. Um, and I was able to start cutting segments and I'm going to grab my wedgie sled. I was able to start making the segments and successfully glue them up, uh, that same afternoon. Um, so this is the wedgie sled. It rides in the, uh, in the miter slot of your table saw. You've got uh, two adjustable fences to get the different angles needed for the different number of segments. For example, this is a 12 segment ring. So I'm set up right now to cut the per correct angles for a 12 segment ring. And this is adjustable. You can go from, I believe nine segments all the way up to 156 segments with this simple jig. Um, so uh, being completely successful making uh, the, the, my first couple rings, I decided, well, let's keep going with this and see what we can come up with. So um, could you bring up the PowerPoint? Yeah, we got it. Okay. Um, Can you go to the next? No, it's not going. Hang on, guys. Try your up and down arrows. Okay. Can you guys see that spalted elm urn? Yep. Okay. So that was actually my first this this uh, practice. Uh, set of rings that I, I made. So that's how successful it was right on the first shot. Um, that was a, a really junky piece of uh, spalted elm that I picked up. You know how Woodcraft has that uh, pallet uh, cardboard box at the front of their store sometimes with all the off cuts. So there was a couple boards like that and I saw the black streaking in there and I thought, well, that might make something interesting. You know, I could do something with um, and then it sat in my shop for like a year. So, <laughs> so that is what I created the first time using the, uh, wedgie sled. That was my crash course into segmenting. Um, and then if we can go to the second. And here is the urn that I was commissioned to make. This is Apple's urn, uh, all bloodwood. Uh, 12 segment rings, uh, 108 segments total. And uh, you can see, uh, obviously it's for a dog named Apple. So that's why we use Bloodwood. And uh, you can see it's shaped uh, just like uh, a Macintosh Apple. So <laughs> I even did the, uh, the three footed bottom and uh, something a little different on this one. I added the threaded finial or threaded cap in this case to the bottom so that I could create the leaf and the stem on the top. So that, uh, that was my second segment of piece. So if I can do it, you guys can do it. And it's, uh, it can be that easy. 
So, um, okay, we can go back to the camera. Okay, so with all that being said, how do we come up with the design? How do we come up with the measurements to figure out what these each little piece needs to be? So let's go over that. This is probably the difficult part and it's honestly not that difficult. Um, can we switch to the vertical camera down here? Okay, now let's go ahead and zoom in on that. So when I come up with my, um, the design that I want to do, I'll sketch everything out on uh, scrap paper until I kind of achieve the, the look that I'm going for. And then I'll go to my graph paper and because of the size of the stuff that I make, everything usually fits on a regular eight and a half by 11 sheet of graph paper. Um, and I can uh, create a full size drawing of what I wanna do. That makes it a lot easier when it, you get to the, the actual um, turning of things. You can measure with your calipers right off of your drawing. <clears throat> so I went ahead and started with a sketch. This is basically what we're gonna be making today. Um, First thing you want to do once you're happy with the, the design and you've got your wall thickness and everything figured out, um, you want to create a vertical center line right down the middle of your design. After you've done that, you can then section this off into each of your segment ring layers. Now, I personally like to have a little bit of extra material at the bottom for, for chucking and to, to turn my foot and, and just in case I need to kind of shape things a little bit differently, drawing things out on paper versus actually making them on the lathe. Sometimes, you know, it looks better on paper than when you're in real life, the proportions, or maybe I might screw up a little bit. So I'm going to start my first line. So this would be the very bottom of my first segment. Okay. And Basic segment and turning, we're not going to do anything crazy. We're just going to use off-the-shelf three-quarter inch uh, uh, material for this. So three-quarters of an inch, three squares. So we're just going to draw each line. And then another three-quarters of an inch. And another. And you're just going to section off the entire design. And that'll help you to determine, obviously, the number of segments that you're going to need. So that you can eventually determine how much wood you're going to need for this. And then that's the top. OK, so once you've done that, now you can do what's called segment blocking. So segment blocking is you're creating an imaginary square around each of these layers so that you can figure out what the rough piece of wood will need to be. And this is just sketched in. So uh, this bottom piece is gonna be solid. So I don't have any inside line, but I'm gonna come out here. If I come to this spot right here, that's a little bit too close. So I'm gonna come out to here. So here's my first segment block. Okay, now on the next, this is layer number two, I have an inside dimension. So I'm right here at this line, if you guys can see that, I wanna go a little bit wider. So I have some material to turn away. And then same thing on the outside, just an extra quarter of an inch so, or so. And if this is your first time doing segmenting, you might even want to go a little bit further. Just give yourself a little bit more room to work with. And we'll continue that on all the way up. Should be good there. So pretty easy so far, nothing too crazy.
you'll start to see that some of your segments end up being the same size. This is the same size as well. And we'll go there. Okay, so there is the blocks that represent that you're looking at them like this. Okay, so you're seeing the inside and outside radius. So let's go ahead and number these. I always start at the bottom. Bottom is layer number one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight nine, 10, okay? So 10 layers. Now that we've created this, now we can create a vertical view. So looking down through the top or up through the bottom, either way. And to do that, we're gonna go to the other side or a clean sheet of graph paper. And we want to create another vertical line and then we also want to create a intersecting 90 degree horizontal line. So crosshairs, okay? From there, you need your compass. Set your compass directly on your center line of your design. directly on the center line of your design, somewhere about in the widest part. On this layer six and seven are my widest part. If you've got a, more of an open pot or a bowl, uh, your widest part is probably gonna be out at the rim here at the top. But for this design, we're gonna call this the widest part. So I'm gonna bring my compass out to the outside edge of my design and then just add a little bit extra. No specific number, maybe an extra quarter of an inch or so. Now take that, you've set this to basically the radius. Place your compass on your intersection point of your horizontal and vertical line and scribe yourself a nice... Just like that. Now what we've done is we've created a four segment ring. So one, two, three, four, four slices of pie. As I said earlier, we're doing basic segmenting. So I feel the easiest is a 12 segment ring. So how do we turn this four segment ring into 12 segments? So we got to go back in the time machine back to geometry class, or, or well, a lot of us, I know I did, took uh, mechanical drawing in school. So you actually have everything you already need. So your compass is already set to your radius. So if you place the point of your compass at each intersection point around the circle, I'll block this with my hand, and scribe a line, and then come over to the other side, and scribe a line and do that for the other three points. Scribe there and here and here and here and there and there. Okay. Now we get our straight edge and all we have to do now is connect the opposing lines straight through our center line. This is much easier to do on a workbench. <laughs> And there we go. Now we have 12 slices of our pie. So we can number these to correspond with our design. So one, two, 
three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay. Is everybody still with me so far? Get somebody give me a shout out. You're fine. Good. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. So that is as difficult of math as it gets. Now we have this view. So how do we take the information we created in our design with the segment blocking and transfer it over to here so we get these dimensions of our segments? So as I said earlier, everything is based off of radiuses. So that's why we have our center line drawn in here. So we'll start with number layer number one. So up here, since layer number one is a solid piece of wood, there is no inside radius, but we do have an outside radius. So if we measure from our center line to the outside radius, we come up with an inch and nine sixteenths. So we take that measurement directly from our center line out on our first side of segment number one inch and nine sixteenths and give yourself a little hash mark and then over to the other side of that same segment an inch and nine sixteenths simply connect those two dots and there kind of shade that in you guys can see that that represents our first segment and that will be something like this. So you've got these full pie pieces. All right. So let's do that again. We'll do segment layer number two. Now we have an inside radius and an outside radius measurement. So inside radius is three quarters. Outside is two and an eighth. So back over to our drawing Go this way. So the inside was three quarters and the outside was two and an eighth. Same thing on the other line of that segment, three quarters and two and an eighth. Connect those line or those little hash marks you created. And now you've got segment number two. One more time. So layer number three, the inside radius is an inch and three eighths and the outside is two and a half. So inch and three eighths, two and a half. Inch and three eighths and two and a half. Connect those lines. And there we go, there's segment number three. One other way you can do this, if you don't wanna screw around with actually measuring and remembering all those numbers, you can use your compass. So we'll do one more segment layer, we'll do number four. So you're going to place the point right in the middle of segment number four on your center line and dial in your compass till you match the inside radius. And then just come over here to your drawing, go back in your center line, your center point, put your little marks, do the same thing to the outside radius. And then connect those dots. And there's segment number four. So it's the same, same exact thing. It's just a little bit different way of, of getting to that point. All right. So then you would continue this for the rest of the, the 10 segments. Now you're probably noticing that our top view, top view 
has 12 segments. That's okay. And we only need 10 of them. So these last uh, segment 11 and 12, we're not going to be using. Or maybe you're coming up with uh, a design that's 15 segments. So you fill up this and then you create a secondary one for the last uh, three segment layers or more, whatever, whatever, you, can, whatever you need to do. Um, it's worth mentioning that this is definitely the old school way of doing calculating out your segments. There are computer programs available that uh, you can you can design your piece. It will tell it you can program in how much material you want on the inside and outside of each segment ring, uh, and then it'll calculate out uh, based on the number of uh, segments you have in each ring how all the dimensions for the piece. The whole goal of this process is to come up with your cut list. E yes. There's also a chart that you don't have to buy the software program. There's also a chart and it's on a website called, and I'll send it out as a note, Jack Man Works. So J-A-C-K-M-A-N-W-O-R-K-S dot com. And it gives you a, a basically an Excel spreadsheet where you, if you look up the diameter and the number of segments, it will tell you what your cuts are. Oh, okay. Well, hey, that's great. Thank you, Ron. Yeah, by all means, please send that out. I'd like to see that. Um, okay, so our cut list. And, and again, I, I hope you guys understand that this is simply the way I do it. There is, as with anything else, especially in turning, there is dozens of different ways to do this. But I wanted to give you guys the base of, of kind of the math and geometry side of things. Um, you, don't, you don't have to have any fancy uh, computer programs. You can, you can do it all by hand. Um, so the cut list, this is what we're trying to get to so that we can go to the table saw. So how do we use the information we've created to then fill out dimensions of the piece that we need to cut? So very simply, um, I'm gonna make a little chart here. So we're gonna layer, number this one through 10 to correspond with our um, piece. Just enough. Um, Column number two is going to be, let me get myself a little more room here. Column number two is going to be my um, thickness. Uh, and as I said, everything is gonna be off the shelf three quarter inch. So three quarter inch material all the way down. Now in, in, in more advanced segment turning, you can have thinner layers, you can have thicker layers, you can have uh, special decorative layers that, that's a whole nother level of uh, segmenting. But basic, we're just going with three quarter inch. Our next column is width. So the width is the difference between the inside radius and the outside radius. And you can pick that up off of either uh, either of the views you have. And then the important one is length. And that is the length of the widest part of your segments. So out here at the points. And then the last column that I do is called cut order. And we'll get to that one later. So for these first couple segments, we can go ahead and fill these out. Now here's where you need to do measurements. So we already know three quarter inch thick, that's standard. The width, just simply take a measurement of the width inside to outside radius of each piece. This will determine the thickness of the wood material you need to have prepped for cutting. So here we are, uh, we'll call that an inch and three eighths. So that's number two, three eighths. Uh, I skipped number one. So number one is an inch and a half. Three is, we'll call that inch and an eighth. 
and four is, and we'll call that three quarter. Okay. The length is uh, it's very similar. So you're gonna be measuring the width of the wider part of each wedge. So here we're seven eighths. Inch and a sixteenth. Inch and three eighths. And then inch and three eighths. And so on and so forth for the rest of the uh, segmented pieces. Now for cut order, um, what I like to do because I don't like to waste a lot of wood. So what I will do is once I've finished filling out my chart, I'll start with whichever piece is the widest piece. In this case, the, the bottom is going to be the widest piece of wood that I need to start with. So that would be the first piece that I cut. The second widest, again, in this case is number two. So that's going to be the second piece that I cut. So the process that I would do is I would rip my material to the width that's required for the first piece. I would cut all my segments and then I pull the wedgie sled off and rip my board to the next widest section, cut all my segments, then go to the next, whatever the next widest one. And I just keep working that same piece of wood down so I'm, I'm not throwing away uh, large quantities of wood. Uh, you know, the wood's gonna get harder and harder to get, so I'm trying to do my part. <laughs> okay, so, and that's basically the math involved in that. So when you're all done, you should come up with something about like this. And you can see here, I've got my, my cut order all completed. All my segments are drawn in so that I know exactly what I'm doing. And this segment dimension, this top view that we've created will come in very handy as a double check. Once we actually cut our segmented pieces, we can take the individual segments and place them where they're supposed to be to, just to make sure we didn't screw anything up, okay? All right, so let's actually uh, go over to the table saw and we're actually gonna start cutting uh, a segment ring. Okay, while we're getting set up for that, does anybody have any questions? No questions, so this is a segmenting club. You guys are all segmenting pros already. I got one question for you. Okay, yes. How do you determine the length of the board you're gonna cut? Okay, so. You can actually mathematically figure out what you need. If you take the, uh, from your chart, the length measurement, so the dimension from the widest point of each board. If you take and unroll this segment, this, this segment ring, you will know exactly how long the board needs to be, plus you know an eighth of an inch or so for the saw blade cut, plus a little extra because you need you need some amount of wood to hold on to here on the wedgie sled. So if you've calculated everything out exactly, you should end up with about maybe four inches of scrap that's here in the wedgie sled that you're holding on to. And every ring is going to be different. You know, a bigger ring obviously is going to need a little bit longer piece. Uh, for something like this, um, if you just say we uh, say it's an inch and an eighth length. So an inch and an eighth times 12 plus 12 eighths between each for the cut plus another four inches. So you're probably going to end up with something around 24 to 28 inches board length. And again, that's for a ring of this size. If you're doing a bowl or a platter and you've got a much wider ring, 
you know, you could end up with a, a six foot long board just to make one ring. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah, I got a question on your uh, photo that you had of the on the front page. You had some vertical yes. lines. Yes. That, uh, that uh, were dividers in between. Do you put those into the overall dimension first in uh, calculating the, the width of the piece? Good question and, and, and kudos to you for noticing that. So um, no, I don't actually add that into the dimension. That is, uh, that's a veneer that I put in there. Um, so it, it really doesn't have a huge impact on the diameter of the piece once it's glued up. And we'll actually be talking about that further uh, in a little bit. Any other questions? Yeah, I've got a geometry question. Yep. You were making a 12 segment uh, ring, and so your dividers could use the radius uh, of the uh, piece as your way of marking off 12 segments. What if you had a, uh, a different number of segments in the ring? Yep. How, how would you set that up? So go to our everybody's favorite YouTube. <laughs> so when you're at this stage of creating your top view, this circle, that's why I chose 12 segments because 12 segments is, is uh, from a geometry standpoint, is nice and easy, easy to explain. You can do, uh, this can be divided up into any number of segments that you would like. But again, basic segment turning, I don't really want to get everybody confused. I want you to focus on the 12 segments. But if you just go online and, and do a search for um, uh, dividing a circle into however many pieces, there is a mathematical or geometry way to do it. Okay. Pete, how do you find the angle that you're cutting that at? We're going to get to that here in just a second. That, that's what comes down to the wedgie sled. Okay. All right. Okay. Anything else? Okay. All right. So we'll move on over to the wedgie sled or to the table saw. And I would like to, uh, to, to uh, just uh, say a thank you. Uh, this demonstration. What's that? Can you see okay with that? Oh yeah, yeah, I'm good. Much better without that yeah, no, it's good. Uh, this demonstration would not be made possible by a generous contribution by our own Ron. Uh, Ron brought in his contractor table saw so we could do this. <laughs> you know, do cutting segments, you, you kind of need to cut segments. So, um, so the wedgie sled. So this ties into the question that we were just asked. Can everybody see this okay? Yep. Yep. Okay, good. So the wedgie sled, as I said earlier, has adjustable fences. So this is what allows you to create the different angles that are required to make those rings. Now, the reason again that I chose the 12 segment ring, uh, be, aside from being easy to draw, easy to design, uh, but it's also going to be the least expensive to set up uh, on our wedgie sled that we've already made for free. All you require is a standard 3060 uh, drafting um, triangle. So this angle is the exact angle required for a 12 segment ring. So if we go down here to the wedgie sled, this is, this is the setup of the wedgie sled. and you're done. <laughs> so all I'm doing is I'm, I'm getting my uh, triangle in there until I've got both fences uh, tight against there with no movement of the triangle at all. And it's that easy. So now I am set up to cut the segments required to create this ring. And this is the number one benefit of using the wedgie sled. 
I, I meant to talk about this earlier. Sorry about that. So in, um, in traditional segment and turning, you would do what's called uh, half rings. So prior to using the wedgie sled, you were probably using your table saw with some form of a miter uh, slide. And, you know, these are notoriously not super accurate. So you're getting your, your angle close. You've, you've done the simple math. So a 360 degree circle, if you divide it by 12, gets, gives you whatever the angle is. So you're setting your saw to half of that and you're cutting your wedges. And what's gonna happen is you're gonna take all these cut wedges that are dry, no glue yet. And you're gonna sit them here on your bench and you're gonna put it into a circle and everything's gonna be nice and good except this joint and this joint, the angle's not gonna be quite right. Either, either your segments are a little bit open on the outside or a little bit open on the inside. And that's just kind of how it is. That, that literally means you could be a half a degree off on your uh, cutting. So what they would do is they would glue up half of the segments and half of the segments and then put a little spacer at the 12 o'clock and six o'clock position and then clamp it all together and let it dry. The next day you pull it apart and then you're left with two half rings that don't quite fit together because the angle's off. You would then flat sand that in some fashion, either on a bench or a belt sander or a disc sander until you got a nice tight glue joint. Then you added your glue to those last two joints, clamped it together, let it sit overnight. What the wedgie sled does, <coughs> excuse me, it allows you to create such precise angles that you can glue up all 12 segments in one shot. So it effectively eliminates an entire day's worth of glue drying. Uh, the other benefit of the wedgie sled that I really like, and, and I, I apologize if this is sounding like an infomercial, but it's a really good, uh, it's a really good tool. The other benefit of the wedgie sled is its ease of use. So it's literally put it on your table saw and you're ready to start cutting. It's that quick. That's why my method of ripping my board to length, cutting those segments, pulling the sled off, ripping it to the next uh, segment width, cutting those back and forth, back and forth. It works for me because the setup is so simple. The really, the only thing you have to watch with the wedgie sled is the dust and chips that get down in the fence. That little bit of debris down there can throw off the angle of your board just enough to affect the fit of your segments. Okay. You know how to fix that? Sure. If you, if you take that inside edge and you chamfer that inside edge, just a tad. Yep. Sawdust and stuff will go up in there and you won't have that problem. Perfect. Okay, so uh, in the video for the wedgie sled, there is also uh, a video on how to make this simple scrap depth stop. This is what we use or some fashion thereof uh, to uh, determine the length of our segments. You can obviously use the fence of your table saw, but this, this works really well, okay? All right, so we've prepared our board stock. Uh, this was just some rough, uh, what was left over from some of the segments for the demo piece that we'll be getting to in a minute. He, and you can see, yes. It's recommended not to use the rip fence because what happens is the little pieces fall off and they get jammed between the rip fence and the blade. Yep. And then they come zinging out of there. So it's preferred to do it the way you're doing it. Yeah, I, I had, I, I apologize. I should have finished that thought. So the, other method would be using the rip fence and you have a sacrificial board clamped in here. That's your actual stop. So what happens is once you move past that stop, you've, you've got this whole pocket area for your, uh, your segments to fall into. So yeah, Ron is right. That's definitely, you don't want to use just the bare fence to do that. 
Now I broke your saw, Rob. No. Oh, it's, here. This it comes is, up. Oh, okay, perfect. Yeah. That's better. Okay, and you'll also notice one last thing I've got here on the throat plate, this little slide. This comes in handy. This is another part that they talk about in the wedgie sled videos. This little slide gives your, your segments, they hit that and they kind of scoot out of the way so you don't get any uh, kickback or anything like that. All right. So. Do you have a perfect. hold down on your stop there to keep it from sliding? So it, it does. The hold down is these two little screws front and back that open up this miter bar to tighten up in there. But it honestly, I leave it loose because you don't, this is where it's gonna stay. You're not really moving it from there. And it's kind of fine, like just like that. Okay, so the piece of board that I have prepped, hopefully you can see that there's some squiggly lines on there. We'll talk about these more uh, when we go to actually uh, glue up a ring, but you want to prepare your, <coughs> your material, the top surface is going to have, and I, I use a black Sharpie marker, uh, the top surface is gonna have a squiggly line, and the one side is going to have a straight line. And that's important, that gives you your reference on the sled. So you want to keep that, that straight line against your fences at all time. And the process is basically, we cut this segment, we flip to the other uh, fence, and we cut that segment, and back and forth, back and forth. So a 12 segment ring, you should have six segments that are cut from each of the, fe each of the adjustable fences. We don't, we don't flip the wood, we don't turn it, we don't move it end from end. The wood stays in the same position, just going back and forth, from each fence. You can also uh, just shift on the inside fences, but I have found that because you need this relief cut, this right here, this allows you to have wider pieces of material. You don't have as good of support, and what happens is, when you're cutting on this side of this face, your board can kind of wiggle around here and it does affect the angle slightly. Plus, you're relying on the flatness of this surface that you've marked. So if you're going from this uh, fence to this fence, you're always locating on the same side of the wood. If you go from this fence to this fence, you are changing. You don't know for certain that this angle is going to be the, the, the opposing to this angle because you're not 100% certain that this is perfectly parallel sides. So proper way is keeping it on the same away side of each fence. All right, so let's go ahead and cut. Touching my piece against my stop.
Okay. So um, you can see how quick that is to cut all 12 seconds. Make sure you cut 12. <laughs> and um, uh, I lost my train of thought. So, all right, so that's that. Now we want to go ahead and sand our pieces. And this is one of the reasons that I use the black Sharpie marker. If you use pencil, there is a good chance that you're gonna sand it away. And we really need these marks for the next step. We'll get to that. So sanding is very easy. The only rule with sanding, you don't want to sand either of those freshly cut uh, angles. If you've, if you've got a nice sharp saw like we do, uh, and you're moving at a slow enough pace, the finish cut from the saw blade is perfectly acceptable and perfectly fine for a nice tight glue joint. So all we wanna sand, if you can see all the little fibers and everything on there, that's what we wanna sand off. Because we don't want those to accidentally get folded over into the glue joint and create a gap. So sanding. Just a couple swipes back and forth on all four of the outside surfaces. And now that piece is ready for glue. Put that aside. So I'm gonna sand through all of these. If anybody has any questions while I'm doing this, feel free to just shout them out. How many people out there have uh, experience with segmented turning? Yeah, I'm one of them. Many, huh? I like. What's I that? also like to number my segments as I cut them. Oh, do you? Okay. Well, now, why do you do that? Well, to see what what part of the board that they come out of. Okay. If, if it, you know, if it's curly maple or something that has gotcha. a figure to it, I kind of number each segment. Okay. Just me. No, I I hear you. Uh, so here's one little thing I want to point out. So the saw didn't quite take off this last little corner. But going by the rule, I don't want to sand that angle. So, but what I can do is I can put a, a chamfer on it, since that's going to get turned away anyways, or I can try to grab that and kind of break it off and fold it back. Just like that, okay? There, just like that. <laughs> All right, so we continue going. What can you say about the, uh, the type of saw blade you're using or recommend? Uh, well, I would have to defer to Ron on this. I think that this is the stock saw blade uh, that came with it, no. but, oh, it's not, okay. It's, it's, uh, that's a Tenya blade. Tenya blade. Um, it's, a, it's a typical cross-cut blade. 40 feet per inch cross-cut. Can you guys hear Ron? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So that's it. Nothing. Nothing in particular. On my saw blade, uh, my saw table at home, um, I'm just using a regular uh, a Diablo blade that I got from uh, Home Depot. Um, basically, almost identical to this, except it's red. Yeah, and I use the same. It, it works well. Yeah. So you guys don't you guys don't need a uh, you don't need a eighty tooth blade or anything like that. No, nope, nothing crazy. Just sharp is really the the most important thing. You know, all of the cuts that you're making here on your segments are all going to be uh, cross cuts, but you also need to be able to rip your piece of wood. So uh, as yeah, as a matter of fact, the blade I have at home, I believe, is a they're calling it a combination blade. So it's kind of an all purpose blade. And that, that works for me. So, all right. So those are all glued up or uh, all sanded. Pete, I have one question. Yes. Uh, when you set up that triangle in the wedgie sled, yep. uh, how, how do you determine whether you go farther one direction or the other? Or doesn't it matter? The quick answer is it doesn't matter. 
That's another okay. beautiful thing about the wedges sled. Let okay. me let me finish this and then we'll touch base on that. Okay. All right. Thank so you. I've got all 12 of my segments are all ready to go. So now this is where those Sharpie marker lines come into play. So you should have six segments with the wavy line on top and the Sharpie line, straight line on the outside widest edge. And then six with the wavy line on top and the straight line on the narrow side of the wedge. So you can do this however you want, but what I do is all of the ones with the narrow side marked, those go with the wavy side down against the table. So you should have six up and six down. And this is, as I was saying earlier, why you don't wanna do these marks in pencil because they can get really difficult to see. <coughs> Excuse me. Now there's one I'm not sure. I got my squiggly line on top, but I don't see a line on the outside or the inside. So we're gonna set that aside. Outside and inside, okay. So one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so that should be the uh, line on the outside. And we can fix that. Just by adding it. So I don't get things all mixed up. And the reason we do that is now we're going to orient these alternating between the wavy line up and wavy line down or the line on the outside and the line on the inside. So it's kind of putting your puzzle together. Can I add to this? Brought a small rubber band. Can I add to this, Pete? Okay, what was that? I said, can I add to your comment? Yes, please. Yeah, the, the reason he's flipping those over is because of the blades not perpendicular to the oh. table. Flipping oh, it over right. causes those two angles to negate one another. And the same thing, if the wedgie sled isn't, that angle isn't perpendicular to the blade, it doesn't really matter because by doing this flipping technique, all of that cancels out. And when you make the ring, everything lines up. Yep. Yeah, thank you, Ron. That's actually what I was gonna explain next. But yeah, so what Ron is referring to is, even though I, I, when I set up this table saw, I verified that the blade was vertical with a square. You know, you're still going by your eyesight and you, you guys might notice that I'm unfortunately having to wear readers <laughs> getting older. Uh, so maybe I don't have that blade perfectly vertical or perpendicular to the saw tape, or especially since I had to kind of modify my wedgie sled to fit on Ron's table. Um, I, I may not have my wedgie sled perfectly flat on this table. So by flipping the segments, uh, alternating back and forth, as Ron said, it, that negates that angular uh, inaccuracies that we might have. Um, it's interesting to note that one of the videos that Jerry Bennett, again, the guy who came up with the wedgie sled, he actually has a whole video on uh, purposely tilting your saw blade. So you're cutting your wedges with an angle so that when, you're, when your final piece is glued up, instead of these glue joint lines being vertical, they're gonna be at angles. Just adds a whole nother level of difficulty. <laughs> okay, so you can see, hopefully, so that is straight off of the saw. And there, if you hold this up to the light, there's no, there's no gaps in the, uh, the segments. So this can be glued up all in one shot and it's ready to go. And that's just a rubber band holding that together. So that's, that's a pretty good fit, okay? All right, so there was, 
a question we just had about when you're setting up your wedgie sled, making sure, how do you determine if you have that triangle set up to the right position? So you can actually, since what you're trying to achieve is the adjustable fences are exactly this angle different from each other, it does not matter if they're different from each other way over here or if they're different from each other way over here or if you're perfectly centered. And the reason that doesn't matter is because all you care about, and this is what Jerry Bennett realized, all you care about is that, that the angle on each side of your segments is complementary to the other one. And what will happen is, if you say you set up your wedgie sled, and, and you, this may be part of your design, if you set up your wedgie sled so that the, uh, I think that's called a radius line. So here would be dead center. And I've skewed it, so I'm pointing more over this direction. Hey, Pete. Um, yeah. Yeah, it looked like video froze there for a minute. Okay, okay now. sorry about that. Nope. No worries. Okay. Can you see this okay? Yes. So what that's going to do is, instead of creating these uh, radial lines, so if this is our center point, we're radiating straight out, all that's going to happen is, if I can draw this, this glue line is going to spiral kind of like a, um, a uh, camera lens where it, the aperture would be closing. So you're not pointing directly towards the center. And I, I apologize, I can't remember from math class what that's a tangent, no, that's not a tangent line, but yeah. But you will still end up with a perfectly fitting segment ring. It's just these, these lines will be skewed kind of like that. So for, so for your actual segment rings, it doesn't matter if your setup on the wedgie sled is off one way or another. The only place it will matter is, and again, you may have designed it to do this, is in your, your bottom piece where you're trying to get all of your lines to go directly towards the center. If you're skewed off, these lines are gonna be coming off slightly. Radiating not quite into the center of your piece, but from the outside edge, they're still gonna to be totally vertical. So it really only matters when somebody picks up a piece and looks at the bottom and says, well, wait, that doesn't intersect in the center. All right. Can I add one thing to it? Yes. I've used that technique for lids on boxes where it adds a real nice different dimension to it versus on the bottom. It definitely from the, does. From the side, you can't ever tell that it's not straight to the center or not, but from the top, definitely you can see that detail yeah absolutely um so back to the wedgie sled there was a question earlier about well what if you want to have more than 12 segments in your ring so this is where the money comes in <laughs> so like a drug dealer jerry bennett has given away his idea to make the wedgie sled but if you want to get into more than 12 segments this is where he makes his money. So these are Seg Easy wedgies. And this one is a uh, 36 segments. So this will be 36 segments in each ring on its uh, 10 degrees. 
but the setup is exactly the same. You put this in here and he's added in, these are all CNC machine. He's added in a center line so that you can get this perfectly straight if that's what you're going for. But again, the, the setup is exactly the same. So that's that. And then I also have a, uh, a 24 segment uh, triangle. So he has these on his website. They're $12.99 a piece, not bad. Um, and uh, like I said, it, you can do up to 164 segments, which if you look at the, if you look at the actual wedge, it almost looks straight, but it's like, you know, one or two degrees off. What is, well, your, what is your depth of cut if you want no hole in the center, if you want them all to touch? So what I try to do, and unfortunately this piece didn't come out very well, my saw blade at home is getting uh, really dull. So you want to try to achieve your full triangular segment pieces that there's no tear out or chipping on the, the pointy end of the segment, which unfortunately I didn't do on this. But um, so the, when I set this up to actually cut the segments, I need to make sure that I'm measuring to the exact cutting side of the blade to verify that when I make this wedge, I'm creating a perfect pointed triangle. So that the first layer for me, because I always do a segmented first layer is always the most difficult. Sometimes I've even gone back to the traditional way of doing two half rings so that I can make sure that I don't have a, a void or a little gap right there in the middle. Pete, now there are, yes. That's really not a preferred way to do a, a bottom solid like that because over time those bottoms will break out. Now, because you are putting the plug in the bottom and drilling that out, you got the relief that you need, but I know many people that have made segmented vases using a wedge like that. Yes. And, and the heat, change in humidity and stuff will bust that apart. So there's there's a whole thing about uh, float, what's called floating a base inside of that ring and, and doing inserts to keep bowls and, and vases from breaking apart in 10, 15 years. Right. Okay, so yes, uh, that was again, Ron, just what I was about to talk about. So the reason I do a solid segmented base is because typically my bases are very small. So if you see any of the professional wood turners like uh, Malcolm Tibbetts, for example, he talks about the need for uh, of either a solid wood, not a segmented, but a solid wood base or a floating base, which means to exaggerate it, say this is your ring layer number one. You would come in here and create a groove where you would then have a uh, solid wood plate of some sort fitting in there that's loose to allow for the seasonal expansion and contraction of your ring so you don't get that pinching action. Um, but they mention a lot of the pro turners mentioned that as long as your base is smaller than say five or six inches in diameter, shouldn't really have an issue with that. Um, but yeah, Ron is right. Um, you definitely want to consider that when making your layer number one, if you do a full segmented piece like this, or if you do a floating base, or if you do a solid piece of wood. Now, I don't really agree with the solid piece of wood because if you think of plywood, the whole benefit of plywood is the alternating grain of each little layer of veneer, everything glued up solid and then pressed. Those grain orientations uh, counteract the expansion and contraction of the wood. So it's a very stable material. I feel like segmented turning is a lot like that. Yes, you are going to grow 
evenly in and out. Um, but the strength of this ring stacked up and alternated to another ring, to another ring, to another ring is kind of like a sheet of plywood. So it's a very stable material. If you have a solid wood base that you've glued onto the bottom, that is going to have a lot more expansion and contraction than your segmented rings. So that's why I don't do a solid wood base. Uh, I prefer to either do the segmented base or the floating base. I've, I've done both ways, but so. Any other questions? What do you change to maintain a grain direction on the outside? So yeah. At this next stage that we're going to be doing, we're going to be talking about actually getting the wood onto the lathe. And in that process, we need to sand flat at least one side of this ring. So in that process, when I've got all my rings done and they're stacked up on my bench, I can determine, well, this needs to go this way, this needs to go this way, vice versa. Or maybe the grain is so straight like this um, zebra wood that it's really not gonna matter for the design, okay? Anything else? Yeah, <clears throat> Pete, on uh, gluing up, switch back. Do, you, do you put a uh, batch of glue, glue on each piece or every other piece? Um, yeah, let's talk about that now. So let's go back. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna go back over to here. All right. So in gluing up, so after I've cut all of my segment rings and I've most likely I've numbered this to whatever layer it is. So layer number three, say for example, or I, what I'll usually do is I'll take all the segments for that layer and I stick them in a Ziploc bag that's got the number on it of, of whatever layer it is. So when I'm ready to glue it up and I use uh, Type on three. So I'm using Type on three. Uh, type on two is, is totally fine or some other brand of wood glue, whatever. Um, I'm using Type on three because one of the last projects I did was uh, uh, Coca Bolo. And uh, all the research I did said that uh, you need to use Type on three because it's so oily. And it, it, it did, in fact, work quite well. Um, metal hose clamps to actually squeeze everything together. Um, I get to try to get everything all set up. That one's not gonna work. So that we're all ready to, once the glue is on here, I can, I can clamp it together. This is gonna be too big. Or you can use the rubber bands, whatever works for you. So my glue up process, I'm gonna take my glue. I'm not actually gonna glue it here because you guys know what glue looks like when it's dry. So I would pour myself a nice little puddle of glue, maybe two, inch, two inches or so. And I'm going to glue up my segments in pairs. So I leave the first segment at the 12 o'clock position where it's at. I take the two on either side, dab those in glue, kind of smear it around, slide it down. And I use my fingers to make sure that the points, this outside edges are lined up with the first segment. Then the next two, dab, dab, and I smear it around and do the same thing. And I just keep building up segment by segment all the way to the last one. And then that gets glue on both sides and you squeeze it in there and you're either using your hose clamp or your rubber band. And the last step, once you get to this point, is to take uh, your hammer or your mallet and just give each piece a little tap. Make sure that it's down flat and all your points are lined up. 
set that aside to dry overnight, or, or at least, I think they say at least four hours before you can actually start turning, okay? Once all of your segments are glued up, um, and, and obviously that glue up procedure is just my procedure, you guys can do however you prefer. So once that's glued up, then we go over to the lathe. Okay, so on the lathe, how do we actually get our piece on the lathe? Now, I prefer to glue up all my segments on the lathe using the lathe as my clamp to squeeze everything together. And yes, obviously that ties up your lathe. But for me and my schedule, working a full-time job, uh, this worked for me. So I would, on Sunday, just make sure that I have at least the first layer, uh, the first two ring layers glued up, dried on my lathe. Then I can always spend, you know, five or 10 minutes each night adding a secondary layer. Um, Again, working a full-time job, it's there's a lot of weeks where I don't get any turning done during the week, so I'm more of a weekend turner. But I can certainly spare five or ten minutes to run downstairs to my shop and, and glue on the next layer so that by the next weekend, I've got my whole piece is already, it's rough turned, all the pieces are all uh, glued together, and I'm ready to do the final turn. So it works, works for me. Um, in order to do that, as I said, you need to have at least one face of your segment ring sanded flat, ready for glue. There are other methods. Some, some segmented turners prefer to sand both sides, uh, either on a sanding disc or a belt sander or a sanding drum, uh, whatever, and glue up either several or all of the segments off the lake and then put it on the lathe and turn the whole thing. Like I said, I prefer to glue on layers and turn them as I'm going. So I'm building up and turning each night. Just like I said, five or 10 minutes is all it takes. Um, so sanding one side for me, uh, I'll either use my belt sander uh, or uh, you can make a very simple sanding disc for your lathe and turn your lathe into a sanding disc. And this is a very efficient way of doing this. This is just a three quarter inch uh, veneer plywood. I had some scraps at home, uh, a face plate, pretty much every lathe comes with one. And then this is a uh, pressure sensitive adhesive, 150 grit uh, sanding disc that I got from uh, Harbor Freight for $5.99. You can get these discs anywhere there is uh, floor sanders for rent. Uh, Home Depot, your local rental place, they're always gonna have the sanding discs for the floor sanders for sale. Five or six bucks you should be paying for those. Um, uh, or like I said, Harbor Freight. So this mounts right to your lathe. Just like that. And Are we, okay, we're ready. So just light pressure. And you'll notice that I keep the piece moving and I can see there's still some marker on there. We're gonna keep going. A little more. Oh, almost. There we go. Okay, so now this surface is completely flat and I'm, I'm making sure that I don't have any spots where there's low spots or anything like that. I think we're pretty good. And I can verify that 
if I take my straight edge and I can see that there's no daylight coming through, turn it like that. Hopefully you guys can kind of see this, but you get the idea. There's no daylight coming through, so we're nice and flat. Okay, yeah. So there, so that piece is all set. So I would go through all of my segment rings and sand them, sand at least one side to get it flat. Except for layer number one. Layer number one, what did I do with it? Layer number one, I prefer to turn on the lathe because I'm going to also create my dovetail tenon on this piece. So to do that, I'm gonna use just a safety center, nothing crazy. And a live center. And since I've already got all my lines in there, I know basically where my center is. I can dial that right in, just like that. Get everything all sealed up. I might add that sandering disc is a fabulous tool because your sander at home runs at about 1500 RPM or 3000 RPM. You can set that thing at 50 RPM and just touch yep. up anything you like. That's cool. And it's and it's cheap, scrap material. And uh, you know, the only thing I had to buy was the sandpaper from Harbor Freight for, uh, like I said, it was a two pack for 599 and I had a 20% off coupon, so. <laughs> Okay, Get some tension on there. And just regular turning skills, we're just gonna turn this round, back away at it. And I'm just going to get it round. Just like that. Now I can change my orientation and we can face off this side. And you can see from my cut, it's another nice thing about segmented turning. The way we've done this, you're cutting all side grain. So I don't have to deal with the end grain really anywhere because that's what we've glued together. So nice finish on that. Now we can go ahead and create our dovetail. And if you guys were in for the last time we actually met in person, which was March. Uh, I think that's when it was. My last demo for you guys was the basic bowl turning using the 40-40 grind. And in that demo, I talked extensively about creating uh, the, the correct dovetail with an undercut shoulder so that you don't your piece doesn't come flying out of your chuck. Uh, so I'm not gonna get into all that again here. If you're interested in that, please go to the North Coast uh, YouTube channel and you can uh, look up that video and, and watch it again. But so I've got my uh, uh, dividers set up to my chuck jaw dimension. Yeah. And we're going to scribe that. Again, standard wood turning procedures, nothing crazy here. And then we're gonna turn to it.
Đấy. And now we're going to use the skew how it was really meant to be. This is really the only thing that I use my skew for is cutting my dovetails. And you'll notice that when I'm doing this, I'm creating that undercut shoulder here in the back. Undercut meaning this back face is pointing in. Camera we on. Can we switch to this one maybe? There we go. So this, this back edge is pointing in towards the center. So that's what gives me my nice stable, strong uh, fit to my chuck jaws. Okay. Leave this a little bit. There we go. Now we'll switch out and get our chuck up in here. Okay. And now we can go ahead and face off this side. Face off this side. This is going to be our first glue joint. So at this stage, you want to be really, oh, God, I got that almost on the first shot. You want to take a lot of care in making sure that this is perfectly flat because any gaps here, and hopefully you can kind of see, I, I've got a little gap, so I'm a little uh, convex. So I'm high here in the middle and low out here. Any gap there is going to show up on your segmented piece, you're gonna see a gap in between there. So what you can do, since this first layer is gonna get turned, it's gonna get dished out a little bit with our design. We can actually, we take our second ring and place it up on there. I visually just get it centered. And I'm just kind of tracing the inside of that. So I can see basically what really needs to be flat. And all this other stuff in the middle uh, is, is going to get turned away. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to undercut just this middle part to get that wood out of the way, just slightly. Okay. And again, I'm doing this because all I really need flat is just the area that I'm gluing to the next segment. Okay, and I can see this is my high spot right here. 
not quite close enough that I could just sand it out. So I'm gonna go ahead and do a little, little fine tuning. And back and forth, back and forth to the uh, straight edge. Okay, so now we're close enough that I can sand that into place. So we'll go back to our sandpaper. Perfect. So one of the things that I like to do when I'm that, you saw that last cut that I did, I was more scraping. I like to do that because it leaves a, some heavier tool marks that I can actually see when I'm sanding. I'm, I'm looking up here and I can see those tool marks getting sand away. And, and you'll see it actually, once you get all of them completely turned away, then you know you're flat. And we can verify that. Oh, well, I didn't sand that. I sanded the wrong ring flat. <laughs> but uh, you can verify that with this face being sanded, when you put it up against that, you can tell when you've got a nice tight joint just by holding it on by hand and that you're going to get that to clean up or the, the glue joint is going to be nice and tight. Okay. All right, any questions up to this point? Okay. Now. I have a question. Yes. If you were, if you were going to um, fix this, the, uh, the hole in the center, when would you do that, now or later? Well, if I was, if this was going to be an actual, uh, piece that I was going to try to sell or being paid to make, I, I would not have used this. Um, I would have gone back and recut these segments until I had that nice tight joint there in the center. Now, if you want to continue using this, uh, some things that you can do is you can, you can drill this out to accept uh, some alternate piece of wood, something that matches the, the design that you've made, uh, you know, blood wood or something like that. Uh, and that also can help uh, that's another technique that we learned that we were talking about earlier about the expansion and contraction of the wood. By removing this center, you're eliminating the possibility of those segments binding against each other and cracking this piece over time. Uh, you, if you fill that in with a loose uh, fitting plug so that there's room for it to grow, uh, that can help solve that problem as well. But yeah, I would not actually use this. Okay, so uh, now let's actually finally get to our finished design piece. So here is our piece. And you'll notice that, um, you'll notice that uh, right off the bat, this doesn't quite look as uh, simple and boring as what we've been designing. <laughs> and there was a question earlier about the veneer layers between. So I wanted to do this to show you guys that there is a very simple way to take uh, something like just this plain clear maple that would make a beautiful tabletop because it's so clean, but kind of makes a boring turned piece. Uh, you can add veneer, dyed veneer uh, between the layers like the mortar in your bricks to just give it some pop. Um, this was a, a technique that I learned about uh, by a guy I follow on Instagram. I actually think uh, Malcolm Tibbetts was one of the first people to start doing this, but I saw this young wood turner doing this. And I thought it was pretty cool. So, um, and I'll, I'll give you guys the links of where, I, where you get the veneer and everything uh, at the end, but um, very simple. So basically what I do is um, I'm cutting, cutting lengths of 
veneer uh, that will fit between the segments and they'll have the correct height and everything so they're, so they're sticking up proud uh, that will fit between the segments. Now, the interesting thing is, and this is all segmented turning, this isn't specific to using the wedgie sled to cut your wedges. Once you have your angles correct, you can add anything you want between the glue joints, as long as that piece has parallel sides. So it's straight cut. All that's going to do is just increase the diameter of the whole piece by adding that veneer in. I think that's what we were talking. Somebody had a question on that earlier. So with my veneer, I mean, how thick is the veneer? It's not even a 16th of an inch thick. So the, the difference is probably not even a quarter of an inch bigger uh, than what I've designed on paper. So that's, that's fine. Um, you can also, you can also make a championship flying disc <laughs> segmented. <laughs> and these are just eighth inch strips of maple uh, that uh, doesn't change the fit of the joint, the glue joints in any way. So there's another example. Um, the roughed out segments before I've turned them look like that. You can see I push all the excess length of the veneer to the inside so that when I have my hose clamp on here, it's not, uh, it's not affecting the fit because the veneer can sometimes get folded over and pinched and it kind of separates the joint as you're trying to glue it up. Okay. All right. And this veneer comes in all sorts of color. Here's hot pink, uh, the red that I used. And then this is turquoise that I used on a previous urn. Um, can you bring up the uh, presentation? Okay, uh, and go to our next uh, slide. So I just wanna show you some examples, of some other uh, pieces that I've made. That's okay. Uh, next one. Okay, so this is a another form of segmenting, but this is called uh, stave construction. So those maple pieces are long, obviously tall wedge shaped boards. Uh, stave construction is is a very old method of building up to to create your wood turnings. Kind of, I think, the predecessor to uh, segmented turn. Um, and uh, that is uh, maple and bloodwood. All right, next one. Uh, this was the coca bolo urn that I talked about uh, earlier. So that's coca bolo and um, uh, dyed pink veneer. That was this stuff. Um, and uh, uh, there's all the details, but, and then a purple heart uh, uh, finial and, and cap there at the top with uh, little um, dyed veneer flower petals. Um, and you'll notice on this, we were talking, somebody was asking earlier about the, the grain orientation. So this was an interesting piece. It was actually a, a, a gentleman and his wife down in Florida that contacted me uh, they actually saw our um, the demonstration that I did years ago on making urns that I did for the club. They, he watched the YouTube video, and he was a be he's a beginner wood turner at a club down in Florida. And he quickly realized that there was no way he was going to be able to make an urn. So so he reached out and, and contacted me, and um, said that he was pretty open to anything. It just he wanted it made out of coca bolo. Um, so this is what we came up with. His dog was, you know, kind of a crazier dog. So he wanted the grain to be a little bit more erratic like his dog was. So that's why I've got uh, the grain kind of alternating layer to layer, kind of messy, 
Um, and and uh, that was what they decided they wanted. So <laughs> it turned out really well. Um, and then the next slide. Uh, just another urn. So this is olive wood and the dyed turquoise veneer. And then one more. And this was a companion urn to the other one. Uh, this is zebra wood, which is the, the ring that I've been showing you all afternoon or all morning was one of the leftover ones from that. Uh, zebra wood and, and pink ivory. So kind of an odd shape, but it, it resembled the toy of the particular dog that, that she loved. So <laughs> that's what we went for. So, all right, so uh, back to the lathe. Okay, so let's get this piece on the lathe. And uh, just a, a quick tip. I'm sure you guys have heard this before, but always mark your jaws uh, when you take a piece out so that when you put it back in, you can, you can get it lined back up. Okay. Now, since this is getting a little bit tall and, uh, and like I described, I, as I glue up each layer, I'm rough turning it. So our wall thickness is, is almost at the finished wall thickness, about a quarter of an inch or so. So we're getting a little, uh, a little bit of vibration out here. Um, so what I want to do is I want to get my uh, a center in here to kind of give me some support, but I've got that little bit of veneer in there. Um, so we're going to cut that out first. Oops. If I can get it out of there. So there. So that's all taken care of. Now we can get hopefully our full center in there. Just to give it a little extra support. Center up. Harold, did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, when he first put the piece in the chuck, it ran true. When he put the uh, cone into the uh, ring uh it shifted it out of true and i was wondering if he shouldn't have tr trued up the inside of the uh the top ring a little bit before he put the cone in for support somebody somebody talking in the background there yeah yeah daryl daryl said he noticed when you put the uh support in that it knocked the bowl out of true versus when oh, you yeah, first did. in the check and he was yeah. he was questioning whether or not maybe you should have trued up the inside of that first ring before you put the cone in yeah i probably should have yeah i must not have been running perfectly true on that last ring when i glued it on but that's okay we'll we'll fix that let's uh yeah i'll tell you what let's do that right now I do the wrench. Okay. That's better.
Yeah, I can see now I'm running out a little bit. I might be muted now, I'm not. I might be muted now. There, just enough. See, I thought. That's better. Thank you, guys. Okay, now that I've got that kind of roughed out, well, let me true it back up since I screwed it up. So what I like to do at this point, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm usually trying to um, turn each layer to size. So I'll go back to my design and I'll get my handy calipers out. So we're turning the last two layers, nine and 10. So I can actually set this up. to turn the widest part of layer number nine, which should be pretty equal to that. Uh, or obviously I can just blend it in, but I wanted to show that as, as, you're, as you're building up, you can really turn these segments exactly to your design as you're building it up. Pete, is that your 440 grind? Yeah, this is the 4040 grind. Want to take a look at the inside to make sure I'm not getting too thin. Yeah, we're good. Okay, so you get the basic idea. This is all just normal turning now. Uh, but again, the nice thing is it's all side grain. So you get these nice chips and you don't have to worry about if you're getting any kind of tear out uh, on your segmented pieces like this, it's probably because either your tool is dull or you're just, you're just hacking away at the wood too, too, too hard. Uh, I see, yeah, there's some little knots here, but those are really not bad. That's going to sand out nicely. Okay. So now if I was at home, I'd probably bring up my steady rest just to give this a little bit of support, but let's see what happens here. And you can see, hopefully you guys are noticing that you can make uh, a hollow form 
And if you do the process I'm talking about where you're turning it as you're building your layers up, you can do a hollow form using just a bowl gouge. <laughs> you don't have to invest in all the hollowing rigs and all that good stuff. How do we get this out of the way? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. Nah, I don't worry about it. I'll just make it work. It's good. Oh, yeah, that'll help. Sorry, technical difficulties. Are you on this camera here? Uh, yeah we're gonna not turn that guys I'm a little thin there and uh, i don't want this to come flying off the lathe. but you get the idea so at this point we would finish turning the inside scrape it sand the outside and since this is a more open piece you want to make sure that you sand the inside just as well as the outside um I'll give you a view. So this is, I kind of like seeing the inside. Which one are we on here? Now we're on this one. Okay. Well, that's dark. Let's go back. Yeah. Oh, there we go. I got it. I got it. Or. <laughs> I feel like the uh, the weather person on the news. So it just kind of gives a neat effect on the inside. You get to see all that red popping through. So this is this is a cool thing to do when you have a more open vessel like this because you can see it inside and out. Um, okay, so I think that, uh, again, normal wood turning, sanding, and all that good stuff if you apply your finish on the lathe. But what I'd like to do now is focus more on, on the base or finishing off the bottom of your piece. And I, again, in my, in my uh, basic bowl turning demo I did before, I think I talked quite a bit about, you know, the, the, the foot of your piece and, and my feel that uh, it's important and, and all that kind of good stuff. But I'm probably going to continue uh, doing something to this. I might actually turn this into an urn um, since that's what I sell. <laughs> I don't sell vases. Uh, so I'll probably add a couple more layers and finish this off somehow. Uh, so hopefully the next uh, Zoom show and tell, I'll have this all finished up for you. Uh, but that's that. So on doing the foot, so we're going to go back to our, our first piece that we kind of worked on. Uh, same, same idea with the dovetail tenon. And I'm going to show you how I turn that into a foot. While I'm getting this all set up, does anybody else have any questions? <laughs> or want to tell me what I'm doing wrong? <laughs> hey. Yep. How, how do you get the first ring and then the successive rings glued on on the lathe so that they're centered or very close to being centered? Yes. Good. Thank you. I forgot to mention that. So uh, as you get into segment and turning, um, you're going to want to start creating centers, wooden, uh, wooden uh, live centers. This one I made fits uh, on the, uh, just on the threads of my um, uh, live center. And what that does is uh, obviously it helps you to center up your rings if you're building up on the lathe. Now, this, I basically have made this to complement the metal cup, uh, metal center that came with my lathe so that I kind of have every dimension covered. But there's some really interesting ways that other people have come up with this solution, uh, taking uh, layers of plywood and uh, making a complete pointed cone and each layer comes off. So no matter what size uh, segmented piece you're doing, you've got a center that will fit and help uh, true up 
the next ring. Uh, because you can, you can manually put this ring on and then just visually get it running true, bumping it around and getting it lined up. But what can happen is if you don't get your segmented rings perfectly lined up, and, and here I did a, an alternating design, you can really see if, if these glue lines aren't in line. And even just a regular non-woodworker is gonna be able to see that. See, I can see this, I must have been a little off on this one because I don't quite line up with the rest. So just um, not even quite an eighth of an inch off. But what happens is if you're doing this freehand and you're just bumping your ring into alignment before you clamp it, even though you may have your, your glue lines lined up visually, if you're lined up here on the top, but your segment ring isn't perfectly centered, your lines here on the side may not line up with the previous ones. So that's why it's a really good idea if you use your a live center, some sort of cone, it, it trues it up perfectly. And then all you have to do is worry about just getting your offset so that your glue joints are alternating. And these don't have to be alternating. You can set this to be, you know, maybe you want a spiral effect. So you're alternating an eighth of an inch each time you put a new layer on. It's all different designs that you can do and different ways to make your segmented piece pop more than the other person. All right. Hey, Pete, there's also a, what they call a log word chuck. Yes. That allows you to do it offline. And I've used that and you, as well. And you can, uh, you can do those long worth chucks to where they go on your tailstock, correct? Yeah, but I've, I've done mine offline where I try to be able to push it, line up my different uh, rings properly. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and again, guys, if you go online and look up different uh, clamping ideas, especially the, the, the turners that uh, glue up their segments or their rings off the lathe, uh, all sorts of homemade DIY clamping mechanisms and stuff and things that help you true up the rings as you're building them up so that when you put it on the lathe, finally, you're not running all over the place. Everything's running relatively true. So there's lots of ideas out there. This again, as I said, is just my way of doing it. Another question, Pete. Yep. Uh, after you've used the, the uh, tail center cone to center up your ring, do you yep. also use it for pressure in the gluing process or do you uh, replace the cone with something else? No, I found that, um, so I use, I use my cone and that's gonna be, that's going to be my clamp. If I've, if I've spent the time to make sure that my glue joint is flat on both pieces, this is enough clamping pressure to get it trued up. You can also, once you get it trued up and the glue is kind of sticking it, holding it into place, you can, you can back your tailstock out and then switch to, I thought I had it with me. switch to something else, say a flat board to give more even pressure or a turned disc that you just press up against there. But I found that the cone works perfectly. Um, in fact, this, the demonstration piece, uh, each of the layers was glued up, I, I think, except that second layer, each of the layers was glued up using some sort of centering uh, cone in the end to get it nice and true. And, uh, there's no gaps in any of my joints here. So I'm pretty happy with that. So you're really not putting very much pressure on the ring during the- glue. No, again, if you've, if you've gotten your, your glue joints nice and flat, uh, you don't need a ton of pressure, I don't feel. It's, it's much like when you're gluing up the segments into the ring, if you've got your, 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 your joints, your angles correct, 
the rubber band is really enough pressure to to hold everything together. Okay. So we've got, uh, theoretically, uh, you know, use your imagination, we've got our finished turn piece in here. And for this operation, I would normally be using, again, some sort of a, a wooden uh, uh, cone that I've turned and I've probably mounted it in my chuck. I have a couple different sizes I use for home. And then that would then be the drive on the open end of this piece. And since way back at the beginning when we made this, we've got our center point from our uh, drive spur, we have something that we can then get everything lined back up, running true, so that I can I have free access to the bottom to create my foot. So just kind of imagine that's what we're doing here. I'm going to bring this up to help true us up. trying to get this piece out as far as possible so that I can uh, have some room to turn. And this is kind of what it's like manually lining up your segment and race, trying to get it trued up. That should be good. Tighten that all down. Okay. So as I said, I, I feel the foot of a turn piece is really important. I don't know how many of the members are out there on, uh, you know, different social media, like take Instagram, for example. Uh, I really like Instagram because all it is is pictures. So I follow tons of wood turners and I don't have to hear any of their political BS or look at pictures of their ugly kids. I just get to see <laughs> their wood turning. Um, the, but unfortunately, there's a lot of up and coming younger wood turners that really are not doing anything they they've taken so much time to make a beautiful bowl or, or vessel or whatever and then they're just taking it off the lathe with the tenon on there and they're just sanding it flat i i we all know that for a, a proper piece to sit and be steady on a table or a shelf it needs to be turned it needs to be running through it needs to be concave so that only the outermost points of the foot are touching the table. And I feel that uh, when a wood turner takes the effort to uh, make the foot correctly and blend it into the design of the piece, I think that's one of the true signs of a good wood turner. Um, so, but that's just my opinion. <laughs> so uh, I like to do kind of like an OG type shape to my, um, the feet of my pieces, whether it's a bowl or a uh, vessel. So this is how I do that. When I've created my tenon way back, what, three days ago when we were at that stage, uh, I have this particular moment uh, in mind. I've sized my tenon not only to uh, fit my chuck jaws, but so that when I get to this stage, I have enough wood left to create uh, the stable base that's appropriately sized for my piece. Uh, and I follow the, uh, the golden rule. So the Pythagorean theorem, the, uh, the rule of thirds, the diameter of the foot should be a third of the diameter of the widest part of your piece. So we know what this diameter is. So the foot needs to be turned down appropriate for that diameter. We're just gonna wing it here, but so you'll get the idea. So I'm gonna take my dovetail tenon 
and I'm just going to slowly my tool rest set right. Slowly create this curve. until I achieve the look that I'm going for. Something in that fashion. Now you notice that when I started turning this, I was coming from the outside, coming down, and I was starting to get a little grabby right there at the end. That's because I'm actually not following uh, proper grain orientation. Uh, you should be turning from the center out. So that's why I made my final cleanup cut in that direction. So there's, uh, granted it's large, but I want you guys to be able to see, uh, can we go to the top camera maybe? Yeah, there we go. Uh, I wanted you guys to kind of be able to see what that should look like. So from there, we're gonna then dish out the center. Again, standard, standard turning procedures, nothing, Nothing super unique here. So we're making that surface concave. Checking it with our straight edge. So we've got a nice curve there so that just the outside points are what are on their table or shelf. So it's gonna be nice and stable. No steps or anything in there. So. so at this point, I'm happy with the turning, the shape and everything like that. I would go ahead and sand all this and blend it in to the rest of blend this into the rest of the curve of my piece. So I've got this kind of like uh, gentle curve happening. Once I'm happy with all the sanding and I don't need to go any further, I'm gonna make two additional cuts. And the goal is that these cuts are so good and clean that I don't need to do any additional sanding. And for this, yeah. So for this, okay, I've got an old, cheap, I don't even know, I think this came with my first uh, Delta lathe, but it's just a high-speed steel, um, it was a scraper. I turned it into a purpose-built, uh, let's go, there we go, a purpose-built 90-degree spear point. Don't even ask me what the angles are. All I know is it's 90 degrees. This is relieved way back. Okay. And I will use that to create a little V. Just like that. And on something this size, I might go two. And this is really for all the wood turners. You guys are going to pick the piece up and, and recognize, okay, he actually turned the bottom of that. He didn't sand it flat uh, or any of those cheating things. And then I'm going to use the same tool and I'm going to come up here this way and I'm going to create a little lift. A little 90 degree step. And that finishes off that kind of OG shape. And what I like about doing that is it creates kind of a, a shadow line when the piece is picked up or even when it's sitting on the table, that sharp edge uh, is going to kind of catch the light and create a little bit of a shadow. Um, one of the things that I learned early on is that anything looks better when you have it up on a pedestal. 
So that's one of the reasons I like my pieces to have a foot. It lifts the thing off the table. And if you create it enough and, and have this kind of shadow line in there, it will almost make it look like the piece is just floating on the table because it creates a dark spot down here. I like that. <laughs> and I'm doing the demonstration, so it's up to me. So, um, so that's basically it. And as long as all that's nice and clean, shouldn't be any sandy needed to that. Uh, the, the V cut in the bottom also gives me kind of a line that I can use to kind of put my signature or something to kind of follow the curve. So, all right. Uh, if we can go back to the PowerPoint. Those two details added a lot, Pete. That's really nice. What, say, I'm sorry, say that again? I said those two little details added a whole bunch to it. It looks really nice. It does, yeah. I really, I, I, I probably need to come up with a different foot because I'm finding I'm doing that on everything now. So, but I like it. It, it's, it really sets it off. Um, so, next slide. So, okay. So, if you, if you're interested from my little demo here on uh, segmented turning, or you already do segmented turning and you, you want to know a little bit more, here's a little bit of continuing education. So, uh, again, of course, YouTube. Um, you can check out lots of videos by Malcolm Tibbetts. I mean, he's, he's the man. He has uh, just some spectacular videos. He's almost gotten away from wood turning and he's doing segmenting, but creating these massive installation pieces. Uh, these Mobius shapes and things like that, really fascinating to watch. But, but the segmenting, uh, portion is is all the same. Uh, he's also, of course, on Instagram, but he's not on there very much. I think it's, it's uh, not his preferred uh, media. The next one is the guy we've been talking about all during the demonstration that created the wedgie sled. So Jerry Bennett, his website is Seg Easy, where you can see all the videos. He's got links to all the videos on YouTube. You can buy his uh, wedges. Again, those are like twelve ninety nine a piece. Um, and he's got some incredible art pieces. He does some segmenting. He does a lot of open segmented pieces where the, uh, each layer of segmented rings has gaps in them. Oh, we're not on the camera. <laughs> each layer has gaps in them. So you can actually see through the piece like lattice work. And then he will take it one step further and he will turn it in kind of a wavy fashion uh, to give the whole piece this undulating appearance. Really fascinating. Um, so definitely check out his website. Uh, the next one, um, if you go on YouTube and you look up woodworking, you're probably going to come across this guy, Frank Howard. Uh, he's a strange guy, but his, his videos on YouTube are just fascinating. He does all sorts of woodworking, uh, but he incorporates a lot of CNC routing into it. Uh, for example, he will take a, a walnut bowl that he roughed out years ago, and it's got cracks and everything in it. So he will cut out those cracks, and then he will CNC route uh, specific shapes out of segmented components that he's made to, to glue in. And just some incredible ideas this guy has. Um, and his videos are some of the best, um, like, how-to videos on YouTube. His method of production, his stop-motion uh, uh, video is just fascinating to watch. You, you will get lost watching his videos. And his workshop is spectacular. <laughs> um, okay, and then uh, the next one on the list there is uh, Kyle Toth. That's the guy that inspired me. Uh, he's a younger wood turner, but uh, he does this veneer inlay uh, technique on just about everything he, he does. And he's got uh, some great videos on YouTube of watching the process. He did, a, he did a series of, I think, 50 small segmented vases that then got auctioned off for, for something. I can't remember what it was. But I think it's about a 20, 25 minute video of just the whole process 
hardly any talking, just him doing what he does. So he, he's, a, he's another interesting one. And then the last one is me. <laughs> so I'm on Instagram. Um, if you guys want to check it out, come, come see what I'm doing. Uh, then on the next slide, so supplies. We've been talking about the wedgie sled. Everything to build the wedgie sled, you should be able to buy from Home Depot or Lowe's or, or any other um, lumber supplier like that. Uh, three quarter MDF sheets, uh, a quarter of a sheet, so that's uh, uh, two, two foot by four foot, is plenty to make the wedgie sled. And then the leftover uh, you can use to make your sanding disc. Um, the uh, drafting triangle that we used, wherever I put that, that you can get at any, no, you can get that at any office supply store, should cost you maybe two or three bucks. Uh, or Amazon, of course. Uh, the wedgies that we talked about earlier from Seg Easy. And then now the big one is the dyed veneer. So all of these pieces of veneer that I use. So you can order some colors of veneer from uh, Woodcraft and Craft Supplies, uh, but they're, they don't have a lot of choices. So to get these more unique colors, you want to go definitely the first name on the list, which is dyedveneer.com. They sell uh, veneer for a lot of uh, luthiers, music instruments and things like that. So they've got dozens of different colors and prices are really not that bad. Uh, veneer Supplies is another one. And then uh, sveneers.com. Those were the three that I found all kind of comparable in price, but um, each one has slightly different colors than the other. So, um, and that's it. So that is segmenting for dummies. I, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the demonstration. And uh, if anybody has any questions, just uh, shout them out. Pete, that was excellent. Uh, you, got, you got an 11 out of 10. <laughs> Thank you. Do we, how many, how many members do we still have watching? Did I lose anybody? We have 61 people still online. So nice job. All right. Great. Yeah, very, very nice. Very well done. Um, you, you had a lot of thought put into it. It was. It thank was you. Good. And, and Ron, especially to you, thank you for, for your extra input. I, I really do appreciate that. You know, it's, you know, I'm not a pro at these demos, so I'm sure I'm fumbling a little bit. And it's, it's, uh, it's difficult when you guys are actually there in front of me, but at least you get some reaction <laughs> here. This is a weird experience. I'm just, I'm just talking to a camera. It, it, I have no idea if you guys are sleeping or whatever. Luckily, <laughs> luckily the guys here are giving a little chuckle every once in a while, but I have no idea what's going on on the other end. I, I gotta, I gotta say the pro turners that we've had, I got to hand it to them. This is, this is weird. <laughs> Uh, Pete, I've got a question. Pete, um, when you were doing, when you uh, are uh, turning the foot, you're using yes. in the real in the real uh, life situation, you'd have tailstock support. And yeah, oh yeah, definitely. If I've got the whole piece in there, yes. So how do you? Uh, how much of a knob yep. do you leave, uh, or how much does so, the tailstock get in the way of what you're doing? So it does get in the way. So what I'll do at that point is. I always end up leaving a little bit of a nub on the very end, but um, I'll turn it down as close to the, the little cup in the, uh, in the live center as I can. And I'll probably switch to my smaller bowl gouge so that I can get in there, you know, even just a little bit more uh, tighter Then my last bit that I'll do is still leaving it pinched between the, the drive center and the tail center. I have a coping saw that I've set up so that I can then go in there and I can just saw that nub off and I can usually get it to where I'm just leaving about a 16th of an inch still on the finished piece. So kind of like this and I'll take the coping saw down and I'll cut that as close as I can. Then from there, everything is already all sanded and finished. Then I just set up my sander and I, I hold this, um, if you guys can see this, I hold this and I've got my, uh, my sander on my drill and I'm just sanding just that little spot to blend it in. 
And that's basically how I finish everything that I do. Kind of like Mike, I think you do that on your drill press. Yes. Yeah. So the same thing, but I'm, I'm just doing it freehand. Yeah. I, I moved mine to where mine's a uh, Jacob's chuck on the, on the lathe. On the I lathe. Yeah. It's smart to hold the piece and adjust because the drill for me seems to wander and I end up touching part of the yeah. thing. That drill press. Yeah. What I try to end up because when I, when I create that dish in the bottom of my pieces, I tend to go a little bit deeper so that when I'm sanding that, I will, I will kick the, uh, the drill sander off. So I'm really just sanding from on the corner of the sanding disc. And that helps me avoid kind of skidding off and, and hitting some of the details I work so hard on. Getting back to the uh, table saw, the, uh, yep. the extra piece on the other side of the blade, how is that held on? Oh, okay. That's a good question. See all these things I forgot to talk about. So in the video where you create your wedgie sled, they describe how to create this, which is this little ramp you're asking about and a sacrificial throat plate. So this is a zero clearance throat plate that you make up to fit your table saw. And then you're just gonna attach on this with just two screws, no big deal. So okay. here, <clears throat> because I was not sure, uh, I, I kind of suspected since uh, we found out that not every table saw, every table saw has the, the miter slots in exactly the same spot. So I had to modify my wedgie sled. So I created another one of these little ramps and brought it and just stuck it on with double stick tape. So that's how we did this. And it actually worked really well. Um, I did toy around with trying to make this uh, and using magnets to hold. Uh, we lost audio on your side. Yeah, and all of a sudden went boom. Nope, nope. 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 <laughs> Battery. Battery went dead. We're waiting. Didn't pay the phone bill. While while we're <laughs> while we while we're waiting, I got a couple of comments to add. I would be remiss if I didn't mention segmentedwoodturners.org. It's the uh, virtual club within the uh, AAW, uh, and of course, I'm on the board of that, so I have to plug that. So I'm sorry. The other thing is, uh, I saw a comment early on about the table saw. And, and Rick Weinbrenner was, was giving you a compliment. He said he hated the table saw and didn't plan to watch, but the whole demo, but he just couldn't stop watching Super Job Pete Helpers and thank you. Um, you can do this on a chop saw. Uh, it is possible to do it on a chop saw and there's a whole bunch of videos to show you how to do it safely so you don't have your fingers in close to the blade when you're doing the chopping. Um, but that isn't also, so if you don't have a table saw, uh, there is a way to get you uh, involved in this if you so desire. If you do go to Segmented Wood Turners, uh, look on that page in about the center, there's a thing called Photos of the Week. And if you click on that, you will see some absolutely awesome segmented pieces that have been done, uh, including people like uh, Malcolm Tibbetts and Jerry Bennett, and they're all on there. Um, and hopefully in a minute, we will, uh, we will, we'll get some audio back and, uh, I can shut up and let, let Pete talk. No, we're still dead, Pete. We see your lips moving, but no sound. Sounds good. While they're, while they're doing the sound, and maybe you can comment on this, Ron. We, everyone focuses on the, the wood glue ups and, and getting those, you know, how long is it glued for and how much pressure and everything. And what I found was interesting was when I moved to open segmented turning, you're holding pieces on with just your fingertip and you're counting to 10. And by the time you're, you're done, 
you're moving on to the next piece. Really? So. Yeah, I used to, I used to glue and, and clamp and wait for a whole a whole day. And one day I was at Malcolm Tibbetts' shop, and Mal was watching Malcolm glue up some pieces. Oh, I get and, and Malcolm I laughed at me, and Malcolm said, "No, no, 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 no. Just what you said. You basically get the two pieces with the glue. You hold them together, and then." Um, you sent them there, and after probably 10 minutes, the capillary action of the glue and will pull the pieces together. Okay. And, and you can actually move them, take, take, you can take the rubber bands off of them uh, because, quote unquote, the damage is done. And then you take those pieces and set them aside yeah. and let the glue fully dry up. Of course, you can't, you can't turn them after 10 minutes, but you can actually take the clamps off. So. And in the open segmented, you turn almost immediately, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and you're yeah. turning those pieces to, or sanding those pieces, whatever, on the lathe. Yeah. So it, it's, Are you guys hearing me now? We're yep. hearing you now. Hear you. Ah, there we go. Sorry, batteries. <laughs> Okay, so uh, let me let me finish this, and then I want to get back to everything you guys were just talking about. So, um, so yeah, I, I tried to make this using rare earth magnets uh, or, or magnets, but the magnets just weren't strong enough. So uh, the double stick tape worked great, though. Uh, or making a, a, a throat plate for your for your specific saw. So, all right. Um, so, question for you guys: you, what you were just talking about. Um, on the, uh, on the open segments. So I haven't fooled around with that. Obviously an open segment is not going to work for a pattern, but, um, what, uh, do you guys do that using, uh, the, the specific jigs to get the segments spaced out correctly, or do you just eyeball it? Uh, I use specific jigs and I, I actually, uh, was fortunate when I was in California that James Rogers, uh, who wrote the book on the, the latest book on segment and turning, uh, was an instructor there and he was part of the club. So uh, he has a jig that, that many in the segment and turning community use. Uh, okay. We learned on that, but there's another jig that can be used on the lathe uh, that works equally well. Uh, if you're, if you watch any of Earl's segmented work workshop on YouTube, uh, I think that's the name of it. Um, then you'll see he's got a separate jig that he uses on the lathe. Uh, the one that that I learned on from from James Roberts Rogers uh, was off the lathe, um, so huh. that one was a little a little more involved because you had to have a a special adapter for your specific chuck that you're using. Yeah, there's there's some, okay. there's some people that make a, almost like a turntable with an indexing yeah. pin that, yeah. that you can use to set up. And those are typically done when you're in the like 150, 200 pieces open segmented. Yeah. Um, Jerry Bennett also sells something called a seg easy plate. And yep. basically what it is, it's routed out the same way and it has little um, ridges in it so that you put the pieces in there and it automatically spaces them out. And you can find, you can find those at the SEG Easy or you can also see them on woodturnerpro.com. Hmm. Yeah, I've used woodturnerpro.com and they've got a lot of good the forum there is uh, is awesome as well. Anybody okay, else got any I think questions or comments? Okay, I think that's it. A couple different ways, but that seg easy that that sled seems to be about the simplest and quickest I've seen. Yeah, it's uh, and I think like Ron was pointing out, you can you can definitely do this using a, a miter saw, a chop saw. Um, I've never done it that way, but I would imagine that you're not going to get it right on the first try. It might take you two or three scrap rings until you get that angle dialed in just perfectly to be able to glue your rings up all in one shot. 
um, or you just do the half ring uh, glue up like I talked about, uh, whatever really works for you, so. Pete? Yes. Uh, this is Len Widmer. Uh, yeah, hey Len. Great job, I really enjoyed it. I have a question though. On, uh, in the beginning, you showed some uh, pictures of um, like stave design, stave design. Yes. Yep. How do you cut the angle on uh, for the stave design? Can you? Uh, I can't imagine you using this. Uh, this wing. no, no. So that was well before um, um, the wedgie sled. So what I did was that was all cut on a table saw, and I I had to you know do the old geometry math and figure out okay if I was to glue up or if if I was to cut. Uh, how many pieces I wanted to make up that whole ring and then what angle uh, each side of the, of the staves or the wedges needed to be. Um, so then I was able to, I, if I remember correctly, that was quite a few years ago, but if I remember correctly, uh, it was a fair amount of back and forth uh, between uh, cutting pieces and then verifying that it was that, that I'd actually created the, the triangle that I was looking for. Um, and also the pieces had to be really tall from the wide side to the pointy side so that I had enough to create that kind of curve. Um, so all of it was done on the table saw and, and I, I've not made another one of those. <laughs> it was, there was a fair bit of danger involved in that. <laughs> you know, the table saw blade is sticking up almost as tall as you can go. And I'm squeezing through these wedge shaped pieces. It was, it, it was probably really dangerous. So <laughs> thank you. And if you want to try segmented and you don't want to do all the cutting and whatever, if you go to, I think Packer does it, but I know woodworker.com sells several of the segmented Thank bowl you. kits, including stave construction. And uh, it'll let you, let you play with it, get a feel with it without having to do all the math and the cutting. Mm -hmm. That's part of the challenge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, yeah. Ron just mentioned, well, that's part of the challenge is all the math and everything of it. But I get, yeah, if you want to just jump into it and start making pieces, if you can order a kit, that's, uh, that's great. <laughs> Who did you say had those kits? Woodworker.com. Thanks very much, um, Pete and uh, yep. Ron and Dave Qualls, who is also a helper in the background there. Um, very good. We're pretty much up, up to our, our time limit. And thanks again, oh, everyone. Okay. And see you next year. <laughs>